go ahead and turn off your camera and microphone. Now we do ask that you keep yourself muted during today's talk. Um, hopefully you'll stick around, but that's the other option that you have is that you can leave and watch this on YouTube when it gets posted later this week. Um, thanks for joining us this Sunday. Our speaker today is James. He's talking about motivation. It should be a wonderful talk. It will be. <laughs> uh, can I get a volunteer to Unze? Um, Zima, do you want to umze today? Okay, cool. All right, sure. Great. I will let you know one couple minutes yet. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, can somebody say something? I can hear you. All right, thank you. Good morning. Yeah, that totally works. Let's leave it out there. Okay, so welcome everybody. Wonderful to see you all. And uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started if we're ready to go ahead and start with the prayers. Jesus, 
Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offering, and go for refuge. Teacher, Foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offering, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector. To you, I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage, the three worlds are not like you who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion. Omniscient teacher, feel devotion like merits and good qualities. To the thus gone, I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil, evil gone realms, Unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha. Homage to the Dharma refuge. Homage to the great Sangha. To all three ever devout, homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, 
in all aspects with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds, look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, spurred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my idams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Edam guam ratna. Mandala kam nere tiyam. The heart of the perfection of wisdom. I prostrate to the Arya triple gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagavan was dwelling on the mass of vultures mountain on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of the phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharivadi Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, 
stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it, is, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata, gate, gate, paragate, parasangate, bodhisattva. Ayata, gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisattva. Shariputra, the bodhisattva mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of a lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom. Just as you have indicated, even the Tathagats rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivati Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avagloteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was awesome. Appreciate it. And good morning, Lions Roar Sangha. Awesome to see you all out there. Hope everyone's doing well this morning. Hope I don't bore you terribly with what I'm going to talk about, and hopefully it comes across in a cogent, useful manner. Motivation has been something that's been important to me. Uh, especially going through the practices of training and uh, practice of the Dharma. And motivation is something that waxes and wanes. And so it is something that I was really interested in talking about. And uh, nice to have the opportunity to do it. And with such a great group of folks to kind of break it in and see. Um, I'm fairly informal, so if you have a comment, you want to jump in and say something, I think it's a much more enjoyable to have as a discussion uh, versus me just kind of talking. Um, but I do have, of course, uh, a talk laid out with points to make. So whatever we get through is just fine. Just hopefully it's useful and uh, engaging. 
So whether you're trying to go on an exciting vacation, you're looking for a new job, you're helping a family member through college, or trying to liberate your mind from the mental afflictions and confusion, motivation is key to maintaining ongoing effort and accomplishing your goals. <clears throat> motivation impacts training and practice in the path of Buddhism and the ability to be of service to sentient beings in several important ways. Motivation increases our ability to sustain training that leads to liberation of our mind. The quality and type of our distractions and what actions, words, and thoughts we express. So you can see motivation weaves through the fabric of all that we do, whether it's our ability to train or what we're picking as a distraction, how we're amusing ourselves, what we're interested in, our hobbies, friends that we pick, pretty much most things that we do. With busy schedules, challenging training, and difficult life circumstances, how should we motivate ourselves to continue daily practice and training in the Dharma? We will consider these questions through the lens of scope of practice, the Four Noble Truths, and the seven-part cause and effect method to generate bodhicitta, of which we will discuss the four, first four parts of those today. Because that's about how far I got through all of them well. <laughs> uh, my background professionally. I have a degree in economics and finance with a master's in social work and a license in California to practice social work and counseling. I own a small outpatient mental health counseling group called Lions Heart Counseling. And prior to that, I worked in information systems doing profitability analysis, marketing support, and built a lottery system that was running New York State for a few years. My background personally, I have a middle-class Midwest upbringing, and then I moved to Connecticut for junior high and high school in California for college. I had many challenges in Connecticut, but fortunately, due to the kindness of several important people, my course and direction changed to a much more positive direction. My background spiritually, I have always been interested in spirituality, even as a child attending a Methodist church in Illinois. Although many questions I had regarding deeper understandings were often misunderstood or dismissed in that environment. I was deeply involved in Christianity from age 19 to 21, and I started getting interested in Indian mysticism in my early 20s when a business trainer at a large telecom company introduced me to Pramahansa Yogananda and the Self-Realization Fellowship. Greg lent me many books on Eastern mysticism, yoga, and Buddhism, and forever changed how I conceptualized spirituality. At age 32, I started a daily practice of meditation, which has been ongoing for the last 18 years. Two years ago, I decided it was important for me to focus on my spiritual practices on a lineage and a tradition as I seem to continually avoid certain aspects of spirituality that imposed restrictions on my ego. And I felt that was just a really important thing to do because it seemed like as I was at the buffet of spirituality, I was just picking and choosing the same things and always avoiding the same things too. And it seemed to have just a, a negative effect on really embracing what was going on. So I decided to go deeper. It was then that I started distance studies with a teacher under Zigar Control Rinpoche out of Colorado. These teachings were a year long and they fo focused on the Nyingma Tibetan Buddhist lineage. A little over a year ago, I took refuge with Lion's Roar Temple under the direction and teaching of Lama Yesha, Jimpa, and Geshe Damcho. My given Dharma name is Yeshe Lodra. So with busy schedules, challenging training, and difficult life circumstances, how should we motivate ourselves to continue daily training and practice in the Dharma? And why is it important? Motivation increases our ability to sustain training that leads to liberation of our mind. Motivation impacts our choices and type 
quality and quantity of our distractions. Motivation impacts our actions, words, and thoughts. Motivation impacts the formation of karmic seeds. And motivation impacts our ability to be of help to sentient beings. It was interesting to me to think about motivation impacting all these things because the way I was raised, motivation didn't mean shit. All that mattered was your actions and how you showed up and whether or not the other person liked what you did. So for me, having this idea that motivation is kind of the driving force to everything really kind of flips everything on its head for me. And I'm a very disciplined person, and I've learned a lot of times to just push through things. And I've found that that gets me a lot of things. It helps me accomplish things. It's led to lifestyles and homes and careers and people in my life. But it's also led to instability because with that sort of approach, not inviting things to come in, but setting my intention to go out and to acquire or to have these experiences it's just not really in flow with the way that life works. So I think motivation is a really beautiful thing. When discussing motivation, we consider bodhicitta, the desire to help all sentient beings escape from suffering and enjoy happiness. In order to be as effective as possible, we need to liberate our own minds from suffering through the process of removing afflictive emotions and confusions. Without this, we are less effective in our impact, and we may even get frustrated with the person we are helping or offer help where it is unwanted or not beneficial. As a social worker, I've definitely noticed lots of times when I was working an agenda that the client didn't have, or I saw things that I thought were important they could care less about. And while I have a lot of tools to help people, I've learned I never know what tool it is that's going to be of use. And so I should put my agenda to the side and just show up and be as of good a service as possible. And I think that's a really helpful thing to learn. I suspect every parent, every teacher, every manager has had to learn those same lessons as well. When discussing motivation, we should explore our focus on who we are motivated to benefit. And this leads into the idea of the scope and impact of our practice. In a small scope, our focus is just on a better life for ourselves. Our work, fun times, a house, a car, our friends, our lover. When it gets to medium scope, we're focused on personal liberation, freeing ourselves of afflictive emotions and confusion, and realizing emptiness. In a large scope, we're looking for the liberation for all beings. Lama Jimpa reminds us, good causes lead to good effects. So what scope of practice do we engage in when we are doing routine tasks such as driving, eating, paying bills, and working? What would it be like if we were to change our scope while doing these routine tasks? What would it be like if we didn't get frustrated waiting in line at the grocery store behind someone with a bunch of expired coupons, fumbling around while paying. Or if we had peace and equanimity in our interactions, even when we were frustrated. I think about this often as I show up in life and how different life feels when I'm focused on just my own benefit and well-being versus the benefit of liberating my mind versus the benefit of other people. And it really truly is an antidote to my own frustrations and difficulty when, for instance, somebody cuts me off in traffic and I think, gosh, they really seem distracted. They must really be having a bad day or I wonder what's going on with them. And how do I just be at peace with that and relax into the moment versus worrying about getting ahead I imagine parents and teachers and managers get to experience this often throughout the week, but what if we didn't get frustrated for more than a few seconds? What if we were able to see right through that self-cherishing, demanding self, right into the moment, 
and stop her behaviors and emotions and stories before they ever even get a chance to take off. What would that life feel like? I get glimpses of it. I'd like to sustain it. I think bodhicitta helps with that. The more benefit we are to others with the right motivation, the greater merit we create, and that merit then helps develop more motivation. So we create the conditions for our motivation. That also is a staggering concept to me. That by doing things that have merit, that I actually generate benefit to myself later in life and to the people around me, that it creates this wave that ripples through time and space that impacts everything. The more benefit we are to others, the more impact we have. Lama Jimpa reminded me during our discussion on this talk that from an Eastern Buddhist viewpoint, the only reason we need motivation is because we forgot about the truths of Dharma. We forgot about the Four Noble Truths, the truth of suffering, cause, cessation, and path. We forgot about the Eightfold Path, right view, intention, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. We forgot the Four Seals. So moving into the Four Noble Truths, the truth of suffering and the eight types, Rebirth, old age, sickness, death, union with what is displeasing or aversion, separation from what is pleasing or attachment. It's usually the one that bites me. Not getting what we want and the five aggregates subject to clinging. So how does knowing the truth that attachment leads to suffering motivate us to practice the Dharma? What is our experience with attachment, with people, attachment to our work, attachment to our experiences? When we look at attachment through a Buddhist framework, we talk about exaggerating positive qualities and then those positive qualities take on something in our mind where it becomes real. And then life intervenes and guess what? That shit ain't real. <laughs> something else happens. And then we get really disappointed. And all that was happening in our mind. None of that was even real. So when we take a look at attachment, for example, it seems like there's a lot of information about how attachment's good and it connects us to each other. But yet at the same time, when we're talking about it from this viewpoint in Buddhism, we can see attachment is actually causing a lot of problems and a lot of demands in our mind, a lot of expectations. So I think letting go of that attachment can be really helpful. Don't look at you then. Huh? Okay. I'll look at the screen. <laughs> the middle way. Yes, it is the middle way. And um, attachment leads to other afflictive emotions. And what are these afflictive emotions? Anger, jealousy, sadness, fear, desire, anxiety. What does it mean to train and practice in the Dharma? We're talking about shamatha, the ability to develop this mental quiet replacement concentration, analytical contemplation to be able to look deeply into the source and meaning of phenomena as they're happening, studying, developing patience, kindness, generosity, non-killing, non-stealing, refraining from alcohol and drugs, being mindful with our thoughts and actions. Which brings us to the second noble truth, the cause of suffering. The fundamental confusion that we have where we don't really know what's going on and our perceptions flawed. The ignorance of causality, the laws of karma and the ult ultimate nature of reality, both through acquired ignorance and innate ignorance. 
that was an interesting concept to me in reading the Four Noble Truths again. The idea of acquired ignorance that it might actually be through the company I keep or the activities I do that I might actually acquire a different type of ignorance. And then, of course, innate ignorance that I'm just born not knowing what the heck's going on. A lack of understanding of emptiness is also a cause of suffering. Believing in a permanent, unchanging self and clinging and cherishing to that self is definitely something that I struggle with at times and is always a source of liberation for my mind when I find myself cherishing and holding things tightly. Craving, grasping, and aversion, which ultimately lead to afflictive emotions, and delusions, which are a combination of ignorance and afflictive emotions. So how does knowing about the true cause of suffering, for example, delusions leading to ignorance and afflictive emotions motivate us to practice the Dharma? What does it mean to practice with delusory thought and how does shamatha help? In my experience, shamatha gives me mindfulness. It gives me space so that as I'm experiencing a difficult emotion and I'm watching my thought arise that I can interject something else in its place. One of the things that I started years ago asking myself is, how does this thought, how does this action, how does this feeling, how does this relationship bring me closer to my goal of joy and happiness? And I just found myself training myself to ask that question all the time. And I've shared that with a lot of clients. Not all of them like it. <laughs> Some of them do, some of them don't, but I think the ones that do get great benefit out of it because it really brings us back to the moment immediately where we're stopping to consider what is it that we're doing, what's the impact, and why are we doing what we're doing. The third noble truth that there is a cessation to suffering and there's symbolic, suf symbolic cessation Stopping the negative mind, for example, working directly with anger, shamatha or calm abiding. And we have withdrawn from the external object causing the suffering, but not dealt with the root of the problem. So there's four steps to stopping this type of suffering. Step one, seeing the delusions and suffering are impermanent. Step two, seeing that there are methods to deal with them. Step three, seeing that there, these methods are available to us. And step four, seeing that we ourselves can apply these methods. One of the things that I've listened to quite a bit and read is How to Meditate by Tupton Children and the Lam Rim meditations that she makes available on her companion website. And I believe Susan Farrar was or is teaching this material on Saturdays. I find these meditations extremely helpful and listen often when I experience afflictive emotions. And so I thought it might be nice uh, if we could cue it up just to have one of those meditations on the, uh, I think it's B1, the mind is a source of happiness and pain, just so that you can get a flavor of one of the things that I go to as a source of motivation for me. We're going to meditate about how our own mind is the source of our happiness and our pain, creator of our own experience. So begin by remembering a disturbing situation in your life, something that actually happened to you, maybe some conflict you were in with somebody. And as you remember that, focus on what you were thinking and feeling during it. Don't focus on what the other person was saying and doing, but focus on what you were thinking and feeling. And 
how did the way you describe the situation to yourself influence how you experienced it? And depending on the way you describe the situation to yourself, then you experienced it that way. And then you began to say and do things. So how did your attitude affect what you said and did? And how did what you say and do then again affect the situation and affect the other people involved in it? Thank you, Connor. I appreciate that. So just a taste of something that I listen to that helps me with my motivation and helps me reframe things. And I go to that often uh, to listen to it anytime that I'm having difficulties. And she's got about 40 meditations on that uh, website, which is really great. Um, The next thing I want to talk about is renunciation. And I'm just going to highlight this very quickly and then move into bodhicitta with the time that we have remaining. Um, so renunciation is the motivation to abandon worldly desires through saying that they ultimately do not lead to happiness. Turning away from the eight worldly concerns and taking refuge in the triple gem the eight worldly concerns being the hope for gain and the fear of loss, the hope for pleasure and the fear of pain, the hope for good reputation and the fear of bad reputation, and the hope for praise and the fear of blame. According to Lama Zopa Rinpoche, this is the single most important thing to know when training and practicing in the Dharma. It matters much less what we are doing than the reason and the motivation for it. If we are engaged in doing something for the hope or benefit of the eight worldly dharmas, then we are not advancing our practice and may in fact be hindering it. I personally find it much easier to turn away from the eight worldly desires when things aren't going well. <laughs> That fear of missing out uh, sometimes still bites me because uh, I do enjoy this life at times a great deal. But I have found every time that it does not give me what I want, every time it beats me up and punches me in the gut and sends me back, which as we get older, we find we get more and more experience with that and we just take it in a more balanced way. It becomes easier not to get so carried away in it and to be more measured in our expectations of what comes along and just appreciate things that show up and laugh at funny things. So bodhicitta, I'm going to give you a definition from Alex Burzen and it's uh, necessarily complicated as I think is Alex Burzen. I've never met him or seen a talk by him, but his language is very insightful, but uh, it takes a minute to hold on to the thoughts, I think. So I'm gonna read through it and then I'm just gonna highlight a couple of pieces of it and then move into the seven part cause and effect methods to develop bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, a mind accompanied by love and compassion focused on one's own individual, not yet happening enlightenment, which is an imputation on the basis of the Buddha nature factors of one's mental continuum with the intention to attain that enlightenment and to benefit others by means of that attainment. So to break this down, I think that the key factors to highlight are imputation. So this is basically us naming it and describing what it is. Mental continuum, which we will come back to, but basically this is our mind throughout time and space. And intention, what is our motivation? What is our reason for doing what we're doing? So when our mind is accompanied by love and compassion and focus on our own individual enlightenment, and we name it on the basis of Buddha nature factors, 
of our own mind with the intention to attain enlightenment and to benefit others. That's bodhicitta. Or you could just look at it as loving kindness for all beings, I think, too. That works for me as well. He's much more precise in his definition, but good luck remembering that at a party. <laughs> so the seven-part cause and effect methods for developing bodhicitta, and today we'll, we'll cover the first four. Uh, there are two main methods for developing a bodhicitta aim. One is through equalizing and exchanging our attitudes about self and others. And the other is the seven part cause and effect teaching, which is our focus. And I'm going to describe the method uh, in a thumbnail here. It takes us through a sequence, and this is from Alex Burson as well. It takes us through a sequence of emotions and understandings, starting with equ equanimity, through recognizing everyone as having been our mothers, to remembering motherly love and with gratitude wishing to repay that kindness. This leads to developing love and compassion equally for everyone, an exceptional resolve, and as a result of this causal sequence, a bodhicitta aim. We overcome, we overcome being attracted to or attached to some beings, repulsed from others and indifferent to yet others. The point of this preliminary step is to be equally open to everybody, seeing everyone as being equal in their desire for happiness and their desire to avoid suffering. Realizing that the mental continuum or mind stream has no beginning and end, therefore everybody at some time has been our friend, everybody at some time has been our enemy, Everybody at some time has been a stranger and the status is always changing. In this sense, everybody is the same. Recognizing everyone as having been our mother. Once we are able with equanimity to see all beings as individual beginningless mental continuums, which does not deny their forms in this lifetime, we are ready to take the first step on the seven part cause and effect meditation. So to recognize that each being at some point has been our mother, this belief, it requires a belief in transmigration or rebirth. And for some, this can be a big stretch to see things this way. But even if you do not fully believe in rebirth, you can imagine it for the sake of the exercise and developing equanimity. And seeing everybody as having been our mother, we need to be careful not to see being our mother as anyone's inherent identity, because that can also become a bit problematic. We must try never to lose sight of voidness or emptiness, the lack of inherent fixed identities. Recognizing everybody as having been our mother radically changes our way of relating to others. So that's steps one and two. Step three, remembering the kindness of motherly love. And this may be difficult for some of us who have had challenging relationships with our parents. It's important to recognize our mother's kindness, no matter how difficult that relationship might have been or might presently be. First, we need to take a look at ideal motherly love. The classical texts are filled with descriptions of it. You see it in many animals, for instance. Alex Burzen makes reference to a mother bird sitting on her eggs, no matter how cold and wet she becomes. And when the eggs hatch, she will catch and chew insects, not swallow them and give them as food to her chicks. Can we think of examples of this in our own lives with our own parents? If we've had difficulties with our mothers, it may be difficult to proceed. So we need to address this on multiple levels. It is only by focusing on the good qualities and kindness that we get inspiration. So with this, we start a guided contemplation. Looking beyond faults and others. So first we acknowledge the shortcomings 
but we need to examine honestly whether these are true shortcomings or are only projections on our parts. If the shortcomings are only projected but not true, we drop them completely. That, of course, is easier said than done. Dropping anything completely out of your mind is no small task. We then need to examine whether the non-imaginary shortcomings are current ones that they have, or are they old history that we don't want to let go of. If the faults are no longer current, we stop dwelling on them. They are no longer relevant. Once we are clear about what the present faults actually are, we say, okay, these are his or hers current faults then we put them aside as well for the moment and focus instead on only the good qualities. I think that a similar procedure is appropriate and can work very well when looking at the kindness of our mothers. Nobody's mother is ideal. If we ourselves are parents, we know that it is unbelievably difficult to be an ideal parent. So, we shouldn't expect our parents were ideal either. Then we would look at the faults and the shortcomings that our mothers have or had and try to understand the causes and conditions that brought these shortcomings about. She is not inherently a bad person, just as no mental continuum is inherently a mosquito, which is also not inherently annoying. We make sure that we are not projecting shortcomings onto our mothers or just dwelling on ancient history. And then we put aside all imaginary faults and for the moment, all past and present ones as well. We say, okay, she has or had her faults, but she is a person like everyone else. We all have faults. And then we look at the good qualities and the kindness that she has shown us. So I'm just want to pause here for a minute, and I know we're getting kind of late in the time too, but I just want to see if anybody has an experience with this, if anybody is struggling with this idea of conceptualizing their mother without faults or dispelling some of the faults that maybe come up using this method. Or if everybody's just tracking along or has maybe fallen asleep a little bit. <laughs> Uh, who's that? Chaz. Yeah, Chaz. You have a comment? Yeah, um, sometimes, like, um, I just, uh, sometimes when I talk to my mom or something like that, I just get, like, a bad feeling something will happen. So you get a bad feeling when you talk to her that something bad might happen to her? Or like, um, or when she does something I don't really like. Yeah, I think, uh, I think probably everybody on this call could probably relate to having a moment with their mother where she said or done something that, uh, was hard to relate to. It sounds like this is an ongoing thing for you. That's a, it's a challenge that you'd like to work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you think um, listening to the meditation that we did earlier and this one so far might be helpful with that? Yeah. Cool. Good. Did it bring up feelings of like aversion in you? I know some people when they hear this and they like, you know, sing their mother as this loving, kind, beneficial person, you know, with all these great qualities. Sometimes they're like, oh, that's not mine. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for sharing. James, can I say something? This is Karen. Absolutely, Karen. Um, I had kind of three thoughts around that whole thing about thinking of, you know, all mother sentient beings. Um, I found it personally to be much easier to see the grace and wisdom of my mother after she died <laughs> because then I was able to actually contemplate her life and why she was the way she was and so forth without having her in my face, you know, and 
when she's in my face, you know, before she died, it's much harder to have that. And so the, the, some of the Tibetan teachers I've heard say, oh, that's right, you people in the United States have trouble thinking about your mother as being this wonderful, caring person. So think about your children instead. And so, you know, that is another uh, avenue to try to get to that um, feeling, you know, that for some other cultures, you know, the mother figure is, is much more strongly associated with kindness than in our culture where we are questioning our parents all the time. So, you know, so sometimes it helps. And, you know, before my mother died, it helped me to think about my children who I think, you know, I think of as, you know, I'm trying to help them as best they can. I think they're, they're lovely beings and so forth. Um, but I also then, from the other side, as a parent, um, I mean, just before I got on this call today, I was talking to my youngest son, who we got in a giant argument. So it's, it's like, it's kind of um, our it, part of our culture that's very difficult um, to, in our culture to, for, you know, it's difficult for him to hear what I said. I was trying to help him, but he had a hard time hearing it, you know, and he saw it as me being invasive or something like that. And so it's like really tough in this culture to to think of our mothers that way. And so that's where after my mother died, I and as she was dying, I went through all of these things about her and just let go of, of everything that she did, that she made a mistake on. And I knew why she made mistakes. And I know I made lots of mistakes as a parent. And so I, it's, it's so freeing. It's so freeing to, to release your mother from being this terrible person, but it's difficult in this culture, I think. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in what you said, and it, it's really great to hear your full experience with that, with other teachers, as well as what you noticed in yourself and how it changed over time uh, as your relationship changed and as your mother passed. And sorry for your loss. I know I went through that as well with, with my mother passing and um, when she was on uh, hospice and going through cancer for the third time, I just really I had like a year with her where I was able to have really deep, meaningful conversations about all things that had happened. And I wish it would have happened years prior to that, but there was just a healing that rippled out into all relationships that I was able to have after that. So thank you for your sharing with that. Uh, looks like we also have a question from Susan. Um, Susan, do you want me to read the question or do you, you, would you like to come on and talk? Hi, <clears throat> um, it's not really a question. It's just, um, I just wanted to thank you for bringing up this. Well, your entire talk is like, um, <laughs> couldn't have come at a better time. It's mm -hmm. almost uncanny. Um, I mean, every step of the way, it's been like that, but this, um, thing about imagining that everyone has been your mother has always been very difficult for me to accept or, or try to put into action. And whenever it comes up, as it does often, um, I get very emotional and I, I start to cry a little bit inside, sometimes outside too. So I do have a really hard time with this. Um, and I know I need to work on it. So I appreciate the discussion and anything that you have to say about it to kind of <laughs> help me to get to that point where it doesn't hurt to think about my mother would be great. So I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Yeah, I thank you so much for being so open and, and sharing. I think when we have challenging relationships with our parents, um, whether they were abusive or they're narcissistic or histrionic. Uh, we have these traits and characteristics in our parents sometimes that, you know, 
they were our primary caregivers and we relied on them when we couldn't care for ourselves. And that forms how we attach to other people. And that forms how we do relationships through life. And so I think there can be a lot of frustration and difficulty with moving into, you know, being so loving and kind in our thoughts towards somebody who maybe has brought a lot of harm to us. Uh, at the same time, and maybe they, they weren't particularly happy about doing this or enjoying the process or even taking great care of their body, but they did carry us for months at a time, which is actually further into Alex Burzen's meditations where he goes in and he, he addresses some of these specific things too. And um, I think forgiveness is really never about the person that we're forgiving as much as it is about ourselves, because when we, when we hold, when we hold frustration and anger for somebody, who's abused us and wronged us, um, we stay stuck in the story. And when we stay stuck in the story, um, we stay stuck in time and, and we're really not able to move away from that. And part of us is living in that space, unable to really be present with what's going on. I mean, I know for myself, I mean, my childhood, <laughs> I mean, abuse and narcissism and all that shit. And, uh, you know, I mean, I just highlight what I went through in high school, but uh, the fact that I'm even alive is crazy to me. I mean, I should have been dead many times over with the life that I was living. So um, I get being angry. And I think you have to honor that anger as well, because that emotion was there to protect you when you needed it. And um, I think just doing this work a little bit at a time, you know, not jumping in the center of it where it's overwhelming and it just takes us away, but just working the edge of it a little bit at a time can be really helpful and really healing. And of course, having good relationships with other people, you know, that maybe bring on some of those characteristics can be really helpful too. I don't know if that helps at all with what you're experiencing. Oh, thank you, James. Thank you very much. And uh, Morris, uh, you had a comment in there as well. Um, I just want to piggyback on what uh, Susan was saying, because I've also had a sense of resistance um, um, in terms of my own mother or my mother and my father. Um, 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 because um, uh, it was so difficult to become a person um, in that narcissistic uh, atmosphere where the child growing up is visible only insofar as she or he reflects the self-image of the parent. Yeah, uh, that's hard. That was hard for me. But at the same time, it was very liberating uh, in a way when I became a parent and I began to experience that powerful um, uh, sense of, of parental protectiveness and love, and that my my own parents, whatever their um, alleged shortcomings were, um, actually felt that that deep love for me, in in spite of their uh, uh, personal limitations. So um, um, that sort of opened up that window a little bit, if that makes sense. And and um, thank, I want to also thank you, James. But the talk is very rich and has lots of information and uh, keep going. Thank you, Morris. And thank you for sharing that experience with your mother and uh, your parents about narcissism. I think narcissism, is, it, it's a really difficult thing to deal with. And uh, being in the situation where we're trying to please others and, you know, we only get time with them when we're pleasing them it's 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 such a mind job but i can only imagine the growth as being a parent and seeing it through a completely different lens has had to be like just a really rich rewarding experience for you how old are your kids they're all they're all um uh, legal adults 
<laughs> so they made my, it. My, da- my daughter is my daughter is thirty three, and my my son um, is thirty. My oldest son is thirty, and my youngest son is a uh, is a junior in uh, in college right now. So uh, we're empty nesters, so called. Oh, that's uh, awesome. It, yeah, it was it was actually a wonderful wonderful thing. Thank you. My pleasure. Hi, James. Um, this is Matthew. Hey, Matthew. Hi. Thanks for the talk. It's really good. I um, often uh, find it's helpful for me when I try to view the assembly as all having been my mother to think about it in terms of, uh, like, I think of myself often as an individual being, but I know that I have, like, a lot of gut bacteria, and there's actually all these other organisms uh, within this vessel that make me up and kind of in the same way all the the creatures and beings of the planet make up the mother earth and that this really is what has provided me with this opportunity to experience life and that oftentimes uh, if I'm not connecting with my birth mother uh, that seems to resonate really well with me I don't know if that would be helpful to anyone else but then because we all kind of are these uh, smaller beings, part of the larger mother, and then the field of assembly really is all my mother. Uh, ho- hopefully that's helpful to someone. I think that's a great point that you're making, Matthew. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, seeing ourselves as having been everybody's mother and having, you know, everybody been our mother multiple times really makes a big difference in kind of softening that for sure. Oh yeah, Uh, Sasha, do you have a comment or a question or criticism? (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Um, Yeah, I was listening to everyone and I, this is the first time I'm hearing the seven steps um and so it's beneficial thank you very much um the thing um that came to mind well two things came to as i was listening to this so that the first thing that came to mind was that this is an opportunity to get to view all beings as ideal mothers so the idea of um, the ideal qualities of nurturing. Um, So regardless of, you know, birth mother or mother that is your blood mother, um, let's say I can have the opportunity to I didn't, there wasn't a particular um, trait that existed with my birth mother. You know, I could envision those qualities in someone else or with someone else and accept those things through someone else as intimately as they were my birth mother, rather than, you know, having to only have one birth mother intimacy, if that makes sense. So I've had to do some of this work in other ways and it's been very helpful because the things that are the blocks or the things that come up where you go, no, I don't want to look there. Um, or where, or I've, I've looked and I'm like, no, I don't want to look there. Um, those have been some of the most valuable opportunities um, because they actually have allowed me very clear examples of interactions that are highly emotionally charged. And so when other people have similar feelings and emotions and experiences, once I find resolution for myself, um, when you're talking about seeing beyond the fault, then I can actually be that nurturing 
person have those qualities for someone else who maybe has the same thing going on? I can recognize it and be available for them. So the beauty of coming on the other side of those things that may seem very difficult or painful is that they become assets for other people. And so I found other people who have done that and they have become mothers for me, right? Um, but I had to learn how to receive that. And that was the hardest part for me was like learning how to receive that um, someone who was not that person in like that kind, I don't know if that's an attachment or what, but like someone who is not that blood relative could be that same level of nurturing intimacy, um, regardless of age or sometimes even gender or sex or, you know, th things like that. And so to hear that here is um, very fulfilling um, and uh, is very wonderful to hear that here. I don't know who that might help, but um, that's been my experience a little bit in this similar kind of bucket of concepts. Um, yeah, so like, for example, last night, there was, I was with some friends and there was a little girl who was running around playing and bringing people toys and she kept bringing me things and stuff. And then she started talking to me and there's a bunch of adults in the room, right? There are no other kids there. And, kept, and then she kept bringing me stuff. And then eventually at the, in the, at the, towards the middle of the night, she was like, where are your kids? Because she had recognized me as like a mother. And I was like, oh, you know, I don't have kids, but thank you. You know, like, so it, it's interesting how people, when you cultivate those qualities, how people will respond um, because they feel it, not because they intellectually see something necessarily, um, that it's a, 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 a more subconscious emotional um, relationship. Or a lot of times Buddhism can feel kind of heady um, or analytical. This, this doesn't feel like it comes from a very head oriented space at all. So I'll just leave that there. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. It, it sounded like there were several threads. The one of seeing everybody as a potential mother or parent nurturing us and the interdependence of everybody and how we've just had the benefit of so many people caring for us. And then the work that you've done to develop your own compassionate heart by going through difficult circumstances and really mining those circumstances to get at what it was that were your lessons that you could learn and glean from those and how you can take those difficult experiences and transform it into compassion for other people. You know, a good friend of mine told me this morning, people don't care what knowledge you have to share. They care how much you care about them. And when they see that, that really opens them up to receiving it. And it sounds like that was, that was definitely what you got with that little girl bringing you toys. She definitely saw this nurturing peace inside of you and who knows, maybe another lifetime you guys had other experiences together too, and there was some other type of connection going on. But I think when we get into this area and this space, it really is heartfelt. Even though view is always important, I think this is really a heart space here. Did I, did I summarize those points right, or did I miss something? No, nope, that sounds right. Good. Thank you for your sharing. 
Yeah, if there's any announcements to make and then uh, move on to, to prayers. Thank you all for your time. Really enjoyed sharing this space with you. So that was my first Dharma talk. So wasn't as painful as it was going to be in my mind. <laughs> Thanks for sharing it and uh, appreciate everybody. And we'll move on to announcements and prayers. And announcements coming up. Hi, everyone. This is Connor. Um, so a couple quick announcements. Uh, Lama Jumpa will be teaching the Buddha Dharma study program tomorrow. He'll be starting on the Atara 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 the yeah. So Buddha Nature is starting tomorrow by uh, Arya Maitreya. Pick up the book if you have it. If not, you can find PDFs online pretty easily. Um, but it'll just be the introduction tomorrow. Buddha Dharma study students should be working on their essays, so do it at the end of the month. We already have one, which is wonderful. I uh, hope to have a bunch more uh, by the end of the week, maybe. Um, I'm just going to give us a little thumbs up on that. Yeah, a couple more. Um, on Thursday is Lama Sankapa Day. So Lions is going to celebrate Lama Sankapa Day next Sunday with Lama Yeshe Jimpa doing the Dharma talk. Um, so if you want to try to have a candle or two ready or a fake candle or something that gives light, Christmas lights, something we're going to call them Lama Sankapa lights or um, Lama Sankapaka for those of you with a Jewish background because Hanukkah starts the next sundown. Um, so it'll be great fun, lots of lights. That's sort of the, the idea of Lama Sankapa days. Lama Sankapa is part of Nirvana. It's the 600th anniversary. Um, uh, again, Lions Roar always appreciates your generous donations. We recently had a Facebook uh, um, campaign going with Giving Tuesday that was this week. Uh, it was a wonderful kickoff. Um, that campaign is still open. You can find it on Lions Roar Dharma Center uh, Facebook page and Lama's uh, Facebook page as well. I think a bunch of the rest of us have shared it also. I'm going to close that probably mid this week. Uh, if you want to make donations through there or through our website, uh, lines for dharma center .org. Um, any uh, sort of uh, donations are wonderful and very helpful. We really appreciate that. Um, and this is James. Um, what's your dharma name again? Yeshe Lodro. Lodro. And what does Lodro mean? Because someone asked that earlier, but we missed that. Uh, wisdom. Wisdom. So you're wisdom, wisdom? Wisdom, wisdom. Okay. <laughs> um, does anyone else have other announcements? Let's go ahead and chime in. I'm going to move back to my little. Okay. Right. Right. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholdings of the teachings remain, the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losong, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing unchanging, unfading. Avalokit Teshvara, great treasure of objectionless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losangdrapa, I make request at your holy feet. Verses that save Sakya from sickness, a prayer for pacifying the fear of disease. 
may all the diseases that disturb the minds of sentient beings and which result from karma and temporary conditions, such as the harms of spirits, illness, and the elements, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May whatever sufferings arise due to life-threatening diseases, which, like a, butch a butcher leading an animal to slaughter, separates the body from the mind in a mere instant, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May all embodied beings remain unharmed by acute, chronic, and infectious diseases, the mere names of which inspire the same terror as would be felt in the jaws of Yama, Lord of Death. May the 80,000 classes of harmful obstructors, the 360 evil spirits that harm without warning, the 404 types of disease and so forth never cause harm to any embodied being. May whatever, may whatever sufferings arise due to the disturbances in the four elements depriving the body and mind of every pleasure be totally pacified and may the body and mind have radiance and power and be endowed with long life, good health and well-being. By, con by the compassion of the gurus and the three jewels, the power of the dakinis, dharma protectors and guardians, and by the strength of the infallibility of karma and its results, may these many dedications and prayers be fulfilled as soon as they are made. Thank you, James. Thanks, James. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, James. Thanks, Thanks James. Thank you. That was fun.